couple of years ago I put out a video where I repaired and then demonstrated a vertical turntable from Sharp. Well, this video today is going to be a bit of a sequel to that one. In this video I'm going to be showing you a different model from their range. They had quite a few unusual turntables in the 80s. The one I'm going to show you today is perhaps the most advanced one they brought out. It's from the 1983-84 catalogue and it was a time when they just introduced their first CD player. And the turntable I'm going to show you is the Sharp RP117, which brings a lot of the features of a CD player into the world of vinyl records. Now, the turntable I bought is in need of repair, and I hope I'm able to affect those repairs so that I can demonstrate it to you properly. It's a draw-loading turntable. It's able to play both sides of a record without you having to take it out and flip it over. One stylus goes in that door there, and then the other one is behind this door on the other side. I'll flip it around so you can see the back. It's just a standard RCA output here, which needs to go into a Fono preamp, and we've got a US-style plug on here because I imported this one from the US, and therefore it runs on 120 volts. It says 60 hertz. There. I'm hoping it's also able to run on 50 hertz without affecting the play speed of the record, but we'll find out later on. Plugging it into a UK to US power converter, I can see that it is operating. The lights are coming on. It's quite hard to see on the camera here. And when I press the buttons, it is making a noise. But the turntable doesn't spin. It definitely needs a new belt, amongst other things. So we'll open it up and take it apart. So this video is going to be in two parts, really. The first part is me trying to repair the turntable. And then the second part, I'll demonstrate hopefully how it works. If I remember, I'll put a time code in the video description and that will enable you to jump past the repair section to the second half if you're not particularly interested in this. If you're still here though, I'll give you a bit of a tour. We've got the stylus on the top there and then another one on the bottom which will play the B side of the record. The idea you put it in in the drawer here and when you push it, it clamps it down in the center and you can play both sides. You can see the stylus is moving in here. I've pressed the play button. So you can see this part of the mechanism is working. There's definitely some power getting through to it, but the actual turntable itself doesn't spin. And of course, the reason for that will be the rubber drive belt has perished and snapped and just needs replacing. The same thing happens with any machinery of this age, whether it's a record player or a cassette deck. So it's just a matter of getting the right drive belt kit, which I got off eBay. We've got the main one for the turntable and a smaller one for the draw loading mechanism. The only issue I had was trying to figure out where that main belt went. I couldn't spot where it was supposed to go around. I ended up downloading the repair manual off the internet, which tells me that I need to access it from the base by flipping the machine over and removing a couple of metal plates. So just a quick tip while I'm doing this, that if you do see something advertised for sale secondhand that's quite a few years old and the person says, well, it does switch on, the lights all come on, you can hear the motor, but nothing's spinning around, then more than likely it's going to be that the belt has perished. And of course, that's the scenario we've got here. You can see the belt hanging out of the machine. I'll just pick this up. After a certain amount of time, these belts just disintegrate. You can see here I can just pull this apart with no effort at all. So that's obviously needs replacing. Now I need to get access to the other side of this to be able to get into this properly. And also you sometimes have to clear off any kind of residue that's come off rubber like that. If it's got to a certain age, it just really turns to kind of gunk and gets wrapped around a load of things. You want to clean all that off first. You can see I've got a bit on the motor here. So I'm just going to use some IPA solvent to make sure I wipe off any kind of black gooey residue that's in here. Otherwise it would stick to the new belt that I'm putting in. Now the belt has to go around the motor there and then around the big wheel here. Of course, the only problem is that there's a big piece of metal in the way. There's no way I can access it from the bottom. So we've got to take out this panel on the top to be able to feed the belt through from the top and then get it down to the bottom, flip it back over again so we can put it around that motor. Now, I have to say this is more complicated than you get in most turntables. Some cassette decks can get pretty tricky with the drive belts, but this is a particularly complicated turntable. But we've got the belt in and it's all going around nicely so we can put the panels on and then we can flip the thing back over again and then try and resolve the next problem we've got, which is with the draw loading mechanism. Now the idea is you press an eject button and the drawer will open and then press it again and it will close. On this one, you press it, all that happens is this motor runs, but no kind of movement of the drawer. You can see I can freely move the drawer forward and back. It should actually be engaging on those teeth on that track. So if we remove the motor here, we'll see what's gone wrong underneath. And as we flip it over, we can see there's a little bit of metal there that's supposed to have a cog around it. And the cog's missing. The cog 
is actually down inside there. And the reason it's fallen off is because it's got a crack in it. Now, the same thing happens with the Wartman DD range. They have a, a centre cog in there that's around a piece of metal. It seems to be a bad design idea. So I mixed up some epoxy resin, glued the cog, and then left it to dry overnight. And now, while that was going on, I thought, I'll see if I can figure out where that other belt goes for the draw loading mechanism and replace that. Well, I found out where it is. It's dead centre of your image going around that wheel. Almost impossible to get to, and the one that's on there seems to be working fine. So I didn't bother replacing it. Okay, so next morning, got my glued cog, try and push it back onto the metal centre, and immediately it snaps. Perhaps I was expecting too much, but anyway, got some more epoxy resin mixed up, glued it this time, I thought I'll glue it to the metal wheel, so therefore it's definitely not going to come off there. Next day, looks okay, screwed it all back in place, press the eject mechanism, and can see it is working, but it's got a jerkiness. You can see it stop every now and then. That's because the cog where I glued it is slightly wider than the other ones on the wheel and therefore it's causing a bit of an issue. I thought, well, I could probably live with it, but then I couldn't because it snapped again. As you can see here, the drawer can now be moved. So what do I do? Well, fortunately, there's a chap on eBay that sells this exact part. It's such a common problem. He sold 155 of them at the time I bought mine. Just think how many turntables people have thrown away because that particular cog has broken. And yet for sort of 10 pounds or so, you can repair it just putting that little cog in there. And yes, you could 3D print these yourself, but I don't have a 3D printer. It's much cheaper to buy it from him. Anyway, put the cog back on my motor. It luckily didn't snap. So we can reassemble it all now and we can try that eject mechanism. So just press the button here, drawer opens, lovely and smooth exactly how it should work so finally it's time to put a record into this and i'm going to demonstrate hopefully the main feature that i find impressive on this turntable the fact that you can jump to any track you want on a record by selecting it on the front here so i've picked track number four you can see a light has lit up on the front there and when i press play we can see the arm moves from the outside towards the inside of the disc and completely ignores the track I wanted it to play and instead puts down the stylus in the run out. Now, I was a little bit concerned here. I thought I might have fallen at the last hurdle. If this problem is something to do with the electronics of the turntable, well, that's beyond my repair abilities. Luckily, it turns out it's just something simple and physical. Inside the end of the arm here, where the stylus cartridge is, if you look at the bottom of the image, just in front of the stylus, I'll break out the macro lens, you can see a couple of little holes here, about the size of the tip of a biro pen. Inside one of them is a light emitter, and the other one is a receiver. That's how it identifies the gap between tracks. It gets reflection back into the receiver when the disc gets to the shiny part between tracks well just full of dust so i blew it out with some compressed air and let's try it again so we're going to pick track two and track six here so i press play again we can see the arm moving across the disc now on this first sweep notice the record isn't spinning and i think this initial identification process is to see how big the record is is it a seven inch a 10 inch or a 12 inch so just to figure out where the ends of it are and then once it knows that it can put the stylus down in the track you've chosen so track two there we go so that's working fine so now we can press track skip and see where it goes so it goes past track three and four and five and puts the stylus down on six now of course i also cleaned out the cartridge for side b of the record so let's check that one's working fine so select a track on side b the stylus lifts off the record on side a the record stops spinning and then spins in the opposite direction and then the stylus for side b moves across and into position and drops down or up i should say exactly as it should so we can put the whole thing back together and i can demonstrate it to you properly now the Sharp RP117 really does bring quite a lot of the convenience of a CD player to a vinyl record player, not least of which is the fact that you can stack it neatly in a system and it really doesn't take up much room at all. It's certainly a lot more compact than my main turntable, which is a Sansui XRQ7. I've got no intention of replacing that with the Sharp. The Sharp's just here for demonstration purposes, but I'm going to plug it into the Fono preamp that I'd normally use on my main turntable, and of course that in turn is plugged into the rest of the Hi-Fi system, so we can give the Sharp a good try. 
Of course, I should mention there were other manufacturers that had draw loading turntables in their product ranges. It wasn't that unusual. People like Sony and Pioneer and, of course, budget people like Amstrad here in the UK. And then, of course, there were other manufacturers that had turntables that could enable you to skip around and select individual tracks. People like Technics and AccuTrack and Pioneer. But I can only demonstrate one machine to you, so I'll show you this one. You have complete control over the playback of the disc. Side A is indicated by green, side B is orange. If you wanted to play both side A and then side B one after the other, just press the appropriate both sides button. If you wanted to repeat the disc over and over again, press repeat. And if you wanted to repeat, just say side B, well, select side B and then press the repeat button. The buttons across the bottom are equally self-explanatory, forward and reverse will of course take you track by track through the disc or through the program that you've set for that disc. Q will lift the stylus off the disc and play and cut are basically start and stop. Speed 33 or 45 selected at the bottom there. Now you can play a record in a traditional way from the beginning to the end, or if you prefer, just pick the tracks you like. So I'm going to do 1, 3, 5 and 7 on side A, and then 2, 4 and 6 on side B. Notice the little LEDs on the display indicate your selection. It works its way through the program in the exact order in which you press the buttons. So if I'd press track 7 on side B, followed by track 2 on side A, then back to side B for track 3, it would do that. Now, of course, I'm not going to be able to accurately demonstrate the sound quality of this turntable to you over YouTube for rather obvious reasons. In case you don't know what those obvious reasons are, I'll name them here. The first one is I don't have any copyright free vinyl. Does such a thing even exist? And secondly, of course, I've got an analog source here and you're listening to a digital stream. I best describe it then. Sounds fine to me. No issues at all. I can't complain. It perhaps doesn't sound as good as my other turntable, a little bit harsher, but you know what? If you'd never heard a better turntable, you would have no complaints about the sound quality of this one. Now, I want to show you here that it remembers the tracks that it's previously played. So at the moment, we're on track two on side B. If I press reverse, it will go back to the previous track it was playing, which was track seven on side A. So you can see there the little light flashes to show you the track that's being played and then the stylus is moving in. OK, now clearly it's not as quick to jump around a big vinyl LP as it would be on a CD. Let's demonstrate how long it takes to get to a track. I'll pick track two, Juice, Know the Ledge from the Juice soundtrack, one of my favourites, Eric B and Rakim. Press track two, press start and it moves the stylus in and it just catches a little bit of the fade out of the previous track because of course the tolerance between one track and the next on a vinyl LP is very fine so you just tend to hear a little bit of the previous one and then you get your track that you've selected. One request that I receive quite frequently is from people asking me if I'm ever going to review the ELP laser turntable. It's a record player that reads vinyl with lasers rather than with a stylus. Well the answer is no, there's a couple of reasons. One, it can't read picture discs or coloured vinyl or clear vinyl, and I believe it even has issues with any kind of dust at all on black vinyl. And secondly, it costs $8,000 for the cheapest one. This thing is a heck of a lot cheaper and can play colour, clear and picture disc vinyl. The only issue it's going to have with them, though, you can't use the track selection function because it's unable to see the gap between tracks on those kind of discs. But it doesn't stop you from playing the record normally from beginning to end. And of course, on this one, you can play side A, followed by side B without even getting up from your chair. So there you go, that's a Sharp RP117. A record player that came from an era when records, or vinyl as people would like to call them nowadays, weren't something that was hip or trendy or fashionable or even retro. It was just the way you bought music. And if you had a large music collection, it was more than likely it would be on a lot of records. Uh, why not make a machine that's capable of playing those records in a more convenient way? Able to skip to the particular track you want or avoid a track on an album that you don't like. Play side A, then side B automatically. You can hide this thing away in a stack. You don't have to take up any counter space. I think it's a good idea. And they had this idea in 1983. So given all the recent vinyl revival, what's the modern day equivalent of this turntable? Well, there just isn't one. You've got two different directions to go if you want to buy a record player nowadays. You can either go cheap and nasty and plasticky novelty, or you can go in the other direction and get a, a decent quality turntable, but one that's pretty much as dull as dishwater when it comes to features. You've got a 
belt drive and a manual tone arm. This kind of mid-range that's packed full of technology just doesn't exist now. And it's a bit of a shame. And people will say, well, hold on a minute, nobody wants things like that nowadays. Well, certainly some people out there do, because 155 people bought their flipping plastic cog to repair this one, and this was never a great-sounding turntable in the first place. But anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.